Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic and part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. We have news from all three of uh, Nadal, Djokovic, and Federer. Uh, Rafa holding a press conference today in Mallorca. We'll get to that first, what he said over there. Novak Djokovic and the U.S. Open. Uh, the U.S. Open organizers have confirmed that they are not going to appeal the U.S. government to uh, find an exemption of uh, Djokovic's for Djokovic's immigration status into the United States. Uh, as we stand, you currently cannot enter the United States on a regular visa if you're not vaccinated. We'll get into that. And then finally, a little bit of news from Federer. He has uh, given an interview and has updated us on his status. But OK, Nadal, Mallorca press conference, foot ablation operation uh, has occurred. And it, it it seems like it's been successful. And that is kind of the news is that uh, he is training, he's back on the grass, and he has confirmed his intention to play Wimbledon. Um, with that being said, I, I, you know, he didn't say I'm playing. He said, I want to play. And in that respect, I'm struggling to see and understand exactly what we learned from this press conference, other than th the operation was not a disaster. It did not not work. Right, Amy? It did not not work. And two negatives equal a positive. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, as my mother says, how the worm has turned. Last year, we were looking at Novak Djokovic potentially winning the calendar Grand Slam. Now that's in play for Nadal. And he is out on a grass court practicing and held a press conference saying that he has intentions to play Wimbledon. So all you can do is listen to the player. And right now, it seems like he's going to be in the field. It's exciting. I think it's, it's, it's intriguing. Of course, I <laughs> like your mother saying, you're right, where the <laughs> plot line went. Uh, Nadal, yeah, there he is. And, the, and all these comments I'm looking, obviously, I have this press conference just to almost, almost preemptive because otherwise there'd be a lot of inquiry. So it's like, here, here's what I have to say. Here's what's going on. Now let me practice and see where it's at. And it's still going to be day to day. His intention to play. Yeah, let me read a direct quote here. He says, uh, my foot situation must be evaluated day after day. So at this moment, I don't have the certainty of being able to play. I just know that I want to play the tournament, but we also must be careful. Interesting. Well, it's like a game of telephone because I was upstairs with my kids and my husband called up to me and my husband works in sports journalism and said, Nadal's in for Wimbledon. So <laughs> I, I automatically, and then I started reading the headlines, but if you read the headlines very carefully, it says Nadal announces his intention to play, but look, he's not one to, um, overstate things or, or put the cart before the horse. So if he says that he has an intention to play, I believe that he will make every effort and that it would be unlike him to pull the rug out from the organizers of Wimbledon, especially in a year like this where they desperately need him because of the Russian player and Belarusian player ban. Yeah, gr great point, Amy, about, about the fact that he's held this press conference. Now it feels like regardless of if maybe the you know tendency to read headlines and to make false assumptions when it comes to media is at play here he's gotten people's hopes up mm -hmm. as a result of this and now it feels like it might be harder for him to go back or more disappointing if he does go back and doesn't play which to be completely honest with you guys it, it has me struggling to understand exactly how it benefited Rafa to hold this press conference? I know. I'll tell you how I think it benefited him. I think I said, like I said before, is a preemptive thing because otherwise there would be constant inquiries. I mean, his team would be fielding a great many inquiries. Well, what are you going to do? What's happening? What's with this? So it's almost better to just out there remind you of how uh, the actor Jack Nicholson, when he'd be going, when he'd be somewhere public and the paparazzi would be around, rather than have them trail him, he'd just walk out of the restaurants. Hey guys, okay, here. Here I am. Take your picture. Happy. <laughs> Bye. So Nadal, it's like he, it's almost a, a, a good preemptive move to just, okay, now leave me alone and practice. And the other, what's interesting about this also, even our very dialogue, it reminds you of times when I think sometimes, how come 
sports sometimes gets covered like politics and politics sometimes gets covered like sports. You know, it's like, this is all, we're all in what the realm, what uh, Pete Sa Sampras called it once. I think I said this before, it has a commentary. You know, it's like, we all, in everyone in the field intends to play Wimbledon. Everybody needs to be careful. That's good. We'll all see. I mean, I know Nadal has this exceptional things going on. And so I guess we'll see. And he'll make his way to London. And you know, there'll be some, um, some footage of him practicing at Orangi, at the All England Club. Oh, he is an honorary member. Yeah, I guess the, the important thing is, at least from my perspective, is that he, he is practicing. Uh, and that's the, that's the number one sign that he's in good shape to be on the court at, at this stage after the foot operation and with Wimbledon in, um, in about a week's time. Uh, that's what's more important than, you know, nothing he said, actually, in my opinion, was particularly new or, or interesting other than, you know, there was no, there was no disaster with the operation so far, so good. Um, you know, things are going well. Right. But you know, there's no, uh, people do need to be careful about like Nadal says that he's playing cause it's not really what he said. Um, that, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I just think that let, let's game this out a little bit. Let's say he's practicing and he has a horrible setback and he has to withdraw from Wimbledon because he's just in massive pain with the foot or he can't go. Nobody's really going to be mad at him or, you know, nobody, people will be disappointed, but people aren't going to call him a liar or anything like that. Let's say he goes into the tournament and in the first, second, third round, he has to retire because the foot is just giving him too much trouble. That's okay too. I mean, there's a famous uh, Keith Olbermann, the broadcaster had a famous quip talking about a baseball player that was on injured res reserve. And he said that he was listed as day to day. And Keith's line was, aren't we all? I mean, we're all just day to day, Absolutely. you know, grateful to wake up in the morning and, and live life and, and go about the plans that we laid out. So I, I, I see it as a good thing that he actually had a press conference. And if he says that he intends to play, I take it that he intends to play. And we intend he to definitely play. he definitely intends to play. I'm we just saying I'm just saying we could have we could have known. We know we knew that. Of course he does. Right. So I like I like the Overman quote. That's a great one. Yeah. Aren't we all? And then we'll see. And I think to me, it's <clears throat> so beyond that, I hope he does because I really, I enjoy, I think one of the fun things in tennis is seeing someone who, um, <clears throat> who comes from one surface, scale their game to the other. And Adal has done that quite successfully at Wimbledon, been to the finals yes. five times, won it twice. <clears throat> and he said very early in his career, I want to win Wimbledon. And he said that because he knew it was the most prestigious tournament in the sport and, and no tournament did he more dimensionalize his game to do well at. Now, granted, he hasn't been to the finals in 11 years, semis the last two times, but um, it'll be interesting to see what he, what he brings to Wimbledon this year and how he plays and how the points go. I mean, it's gonna be watched very, very closely each match. And then we're gonna be intrigued to see how the draw goes. You know, where he and Novak are, and once again, the whole draw question that we grappled with at Roland Garros. Yeah, well, we can save a lot of those topics for the draw show, which we'll, uh, of course, get into next week with how Nadal has looked at Wimbledon as of late and, and what he needs to do to adjust to the surface. And, of course, Novak Djokovic uh, is back to being the favorite heading into a major, which hasn't happened uh, at the year's first two slams, obviously, with him being absent from Australia. Uh, before we move on to Novak Djokovic and uh, a storyline that has emerged from, from New York, actually, in the U.S. Open, um, I'm feeling pretty confident that Nadal is going to play at this time, Wimbledon. I think he's definitely going to try. Uh, I'm, I'm not yet fully confident that the foot is going to be a, a non-issue, right? Is that kind of a fair middle ground to, to land in, uh, Joel? Yeah, I would agree with you completely. It's like, I think he wants to intend to seek to desire to want to compete and play. And your point is spot on. I mean, it's not like the foot had done. I mean, Nadal's an incredible athlete, but recovery from these things and where the pain is, um, we don't know. And I think your assessment is spot on. I guess what I'm saying is I'd be shocked if he doesn't take the court. I wouldn't be shocked if the foot is an issue. 
uh, without the without the uh, intervention of the powerful medicine that he was on in Paris. Yeah, and, and, you know, maybe he changes his mind and he's midway through the tournament and doing really well and has a shot to win it and does the deadening again. Who knows? If there's any athlete or any human being who's capable of staying in the present and not looking too far ahead and just playing this point right here, it's Rafael Nadal. Absolutely. Well, um, the career, not the career, the calendar uh, Grand Slam is in effect at the moment with Nadal having won the first two. Let's go to Djokovic. The U.S. Open has said they are not going to petition or appeal to the U.S. government and uh, their immigration uh, function to uh, try to get Novak an exemption of the current rules that require uh, that people are vaccinated to enter the country. Amy, what do you make of this? This is a little bit different than the Nadal situation. The, the, truly, the news here is that the USTA has said that they're not going to sponsor him to get a special exemption to come into the country. That is something that I guess they could have advocated for or tried to get done, but it doesn't surprise me that they didn't because, you know, they've asked all their players, all their employees. This was an organization that at the very beginning of the pandemic was very out front in saying, don't even play to its members, including recreational members, all right on down the line, like, just stop playing because we're not sure if it's safe. So they're more on the safety vaccine do follow CDC and FDA guidelines. They're, they're very much like the rule book. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that they won't seek a special exemption. That being said, these rules are changing all the time. I mean, just within the last week or two, it, you do not require um, getting a COVID test to enter or re-enter the country as long as you're vaccinated. That has been a change that has had a huge impact. So these rules are changing all the time. And it could be that once we reach August, that rule could change too. So it's certainly still possible that Novak could play. I also think the USTA not doing it, which I applaud and I understand, if you look at the, if you look at Australia, the United States as a circle and a pie, the, the, the piece of pie that the Australian Open means, I think to the Australian sport and culture is a bigger piece to Australia than the US Open is to the American sporting scene. I, 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 just, think, I just think the Australian Open is a, is a more important part. And I think the Australian Open felt the need to try to create a situation that Novak could play. And I think the US Open is, yeah, we're a tennis tournament in the United States. And while it's a super big tournament in the United States, it's still tennis. And the American sporting culture has all sorts of things going on, like the NFL and Major League Baseball and college football. I mean, some other sports that are a bigger thing. So I think the, I think the USTA knew instantly, yeah, our tennis term is not that big on the sporting culture radar. To, to warrant us even thinking about this kind of stuff. And then you see all the whole backlash it caused in Australia. And I think it would cause something different but similar in the United States. I just think if, if the USTA and, and the USTA's belief, yeah, we have a tournament called the US Open. We don't necessarily, if Novak wants to come, he's welcome. We got a lot of other plot lines that make the US Open compelling for our fans and, and players. But isn't it interesting, Gil and Joel, that it's the reverse of the Russian ban? So they, they are going to allow the Russians and the Belarusians that's, to come well, that's in. That's a different thing. And, and that, that, yeah. that's applied too. Well, I think that also, I think the whole, the Wimbledon decision was with, involved with the British government. I don't think the American government is applying those same kind of things. We don't have a, a minister of sport. But they are. But they are. It is the government preventing Novak from playing, but not looking, the U.S. I'm Open. Looking, I'm looking at two different things here. I'm looking at two different things. I'm looking at a policy. For, I'm talking about the Russian players. I'm talking about the Russian players, the Russian ban yeah. in the Russian and Belarus ban in Wimbledon came from the British government in conjunction with the All England Club. There is no, there is no American Ministry of Sport that is where it says to the USTA, uh, please don't let Russian players play. Oh, okay. I see. I, I see what you're saying. I'm looking. I'm looking at two different uh, issues. Well, that the, the, American, the American thing on Novak is not sports specific. 
It's not applied okay, to Okay, but yeah, but I, I think I think the USTA and was with every other governing body in tennis that they just didn't and and we're getting kind of off track here. They yeah. they I I don't think but I see what you're saying, Joel, that that perhaps the All England Club would not have banned Russian and Belarusians had they not been pressured by the UK government, which is what they've said. And the US Open has no such force pushing them. It was up to the USTA to make their own decision. Exactly. They could have advocated, they could have taken a proactive approach and they said, no, we're not going to do that. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I'm, I, I have conflicts on, on this topic because I work for US Open Radio and I want to just disclose those. But I, I feel like from, from the US Open's perspective, uh, when it comes to, you know, their philosophy, and it has definitely been on the side of, uh, we are going to adhere and go the extra mile um, to be on the safe side of, of COVID when it comes to requiring all, all employees to, to vaccinate. Um, I, I think all fans last year, right? I didn't go yes. through that. Yeah, yes. all fans. That, that's, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that has been the stance. It would, it, I agree with you, Amy. It comes as no surprise that they are not sticking their neck out to create, to uh, advocate for a special exemption for, for a player. And from a PR perspective, uh, that would have definitely been the, the move that would have raised more eyebrows than them doing nothing. Uh, because right now what they're doing is nothing. Uh, it, they did not ban Novak. They did not say Novak can't play. They did nothing. Um, and that is a safer and more down the middle and PR safe approach than we are going to actually have, you know, fight a battle here, uh, to get Djokovic into the country. What's interesting. And this is a total side note. Uh, what about a player like tennis Sangren, who is a U.S. citizen, he's already in the country. He has not been vaccinated and has been very vocal about not wanting to be vaccinated. He, he plays actually pretty well in the US Open. Um, I don't know if he'd, he'd qualify, he probably would. Um, what about him? Well, do you have to be, do the, play did the players have to be vaccinated last year's US Open? I don't think so. No, they didn't. I think the US Open's mindset is if you can show up in flushing and your ranking qualifies to play, we are going to let you play. We are doing nothing here. If you can okay. just, just show up, show okay. up and you can play. But if you can't show up, then, you know, we're not going to intervene. But if you're a fan, show your vaccination card at the gate like we, do, we all did last year. But Tennis Sangren doesn't have to. Right. right. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's a very interesting uh, <clears throat> approach about towards fans, and players. Fans have to be vaccinated, but players don't, right? And then if you can't get in the country like Novak because the U.S. government, right? It's so it's got a certain. It's intriguing. Yeah. And that policy could change. Who knows? That's right. This is all so fluid. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I guess. Um, Evidently, from just what we've seen in Europe, it, it seems that the U.S. is not, and I don't know this for a fact, it seems like the U.S. isn't in the majority, that they're in the minority to still have closed borders to unvaccinated uh, travelers. That's just what it seems like, because I don't see a lot of issues with, um, with other tournaments. No, I had to show my vaccination card to, both to enter France and to order tickets for the French Open. This is but, why it's but, so but great. Novak, but what about Novak? Why could, why could Novak cross the French border then? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Because, yeah. That... Maybe I had to show my vaccine card for my airline. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah. I, I don't, but I definitely had to upload my vaccine card um to get into the french open as a fan right i don't know I, right uh, and, and th that makes sense a lot of tournaments have had this approach where the players are credentialed uh, on a level that is you know not uh basically they're exempt from from the vaccination requirements i think media and employees by and large have uh or there have been many examples of media and employees 
uh, that have had to adhere to a vaccination requirement, which plenty of people have taken an issue with. Um, yeah. All right. I think, I think we've covered that sufficiently. Uh, we'll see if, uh, <laughs> we'll see if there's more to come on this. Obviously Djokovic now will, uh, be asked about this and, and we'll see what he has to say. And that will probably create, uh, its own news cycle. So, uh, we'll await that. Are we ready to move on to, uh, to Roger? Well, did you want to love just, it? Love to talk about Roger. Well, did you want to discuss, yes. By the way, uh, Novak, six-time Wimbledon champ. We can. We'll discuss this more when the tournament. Well, it's the draw. It's the draw preview, Joel. We're All not right. okay. Hasn't lost there in five years. I have so much to say about both Djokovic and Nadal on the surface of grass. I, I would love to talk about the draw show coming right, we'll up. We'll talk about that when the draw. No worries. Next week. Next, Next week, week we will we will do it. Uh, okay, Roger, let's start with Joel. Uh, you did a piece recently that I want to ask you about. Uh, you read this book, uh, The Last Days of, of Roger Federer. Tell us about reading this book, uh, what it was about, and, and how it relates to Federer. It's very interesting. The writer, Jeff Dyer, is a significant literary writer. He's written at least 15, I think 18 books. Wow, almost as many as our guys have won slams. I mean, he's very prominent writer, and he, he writes a very self-reflective way, but this book it's not so much, it's, it's about Federer in a way, but it's really about endings, about how things finish. Jeff is now in his 60s. He, um, he's contemplating how various writers, artists, musicians, what it's like as they reach the end of their, of their days and their creation cycle. Not necessarily their, their death, but their, the, when, how it looks, uh, the philosopher Nietzsche. And Federer is kind of this uh, motif and I, I interviewed Jeff. We met at a park in Santa Monica, and he and he's very thoughtful, and uh, he plays tennis. And we talked about this. But Feder, Feder is kind of the redemptive person for a lot of artists and writers. The end, you, the creativity crashes. You're not doing as well. You're not as healthy, or or things just happen. Feder almost kind of defies some of that. And also, some some artists, it has to do with reputation. You know, what people are thinking about their work. I mean, there's a lot of, in, in the arts world, arts, literature, it's amazing how fashion goes in and out, how certain writers aren't considered important. But Federer and tennis is performance. So Federer's grand achievements and his kind of uh, age-defying late career excellence is kind of the, um, you know, the suker of this book. And the writer notes that it's interesting, a lot of the, uh, the other characters go by their last names, but he always he was he enjoys calling him Roger, and it's this whole uh, coziness with Roger that he so likes. I think that's true of all the big three. Sometimes I find myself, even in my writing, and because I write for some blogs that are less adherence to certain, you know, standard operating procedures, I'm able to just use Rafa or Novak. And I, I agree with you, Joel, that these three have sort of crossed into that single name iconic status. But I also, you know, as I get older, Yes, that, that is happening. Um, I find that certain areas of my brain are more creative than they used to be. So it's interesting that um, the writer would find that true of Federer and, and hold him up as an example of how aging in many ways can, can be a good thing. Well, he worships Federer a lot of, I, I, I talk, I know a fair amount of, uh, writers who are non, they're not journalists, so they're not covering the sport frequently like we are. But when they do, uh, when they do, um, they, um, they tend to drift towards Federer because he's the most, like Jeff told me, look at this, he's beautiful and he's um, functional. It's, it's all put together. You can be, you can play beautifully and win. And, and mm -hmm. they love that. I always find that interesting, um, intriguing. It's intriguing for me, kind of the whole swooning around Federer and it's different than Nadal and Djokovic. Different kind of swooning. Federer is the, the ballerina, the Baryshnikov-like player who, who moves and inspires such, such a swoon as if he invented tennis. <laughs> and I find I, I, there's part of me, the part of me that's a little, that I, I kind of resist that a little bit, a little bit. I love Roger Federer too, but you know, 
I can hit a slice backhand and top spin backhand the same rally. I know what a drop shot approach shot is. You know, it's like, it's just, it's just funny. But, but the part about creation and, and Federer and his longevity doing it because some artists and tennis players too tend to be the, the flash in the pan and that Rogers been able to do it so well for so long is just so captivating. I mean, if I can believe Gil, uh, he's not playing Wimbledon for the first time since you were born. He, ha he hasn't missed Wimbledon since 98. Yes, that, so that's Thanks. correct. Your whole yes. life, Rogers yeah. has always played Wimbledon. Yeah. yeah. Pretty interesting. Yep. Pretty interesting. So, so this book is very, um, I, I would suggest people reading it. I think it's very engaging, but it's kind of, it's not going to be just about why Rogers' forehand and serve are so great. It's going to be something else. And Rogers kind of, a, again, kind of this uh, luminescent, luminescent deity over it. Yeah, there's definitely a gravity and a, um, an infectiousness to the, the Federer aesthetic uh, that I think the other two have, but Federer is at another level in that area, uh, which is why I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of people who maybe don't even see the game as well can see the game better when Federer is playing it uh, because I think there's a certain obviousness to, to some things that he's doing on the court um, versus some, some subtlety uh, perhaps that goes lost that might be a little bit more important in the game of games of Djokovic and, and Nadal. Well, I think I, I, the way I look at it, better Nadal can grab people even if they don't know tennis. Better does it with the brilliance and the movement Nadal right. does. Nadal's not subtle, really. Oh, so I would say better. that. The one who's subtle, the one who's the real player's player is Novak. Novak is the one. It's like, if you don't know tennis, you think, well, what's going on here? He seems pretty steady. He's moving, but he is, he is the play. He's so incredibly efficient. It reminds me again of, uh, of Chris Everett in some ways. It's like, what's going on here? There just seem to be getting balls. And, and it's, it's, it's like uh, the thing I remind somebody told me about Everett. Why, why run when you can be there? And there's this whole efficiency Novak brings that's so sustainable. And that's a little less discernible than, um, and I think the, the people I know who then like Novak, who don't know tennis that well, what they admire is his, his grit and his effort and where he comes from. They might not know as much about the tennis nuance and that's okay. I played with someone yesterday who literally said, um, do you feel like Novak is defensive? And I was like, no, he, he's not at all. It, it's just, it's not one shot as much as it is many and every. Uh, and that's the difference. Nadal has his forehand and Federer has his forehand and his serve. And well, actually Federer has this entire offensive attack kind of thing going on. But uh, Djokovic is not a defensive player at all. He controls you. He dictates, but still he has this reputation, right? A false reputation of, Wait, he just plays defense neutral. No, um, there's some who don't know the game. I mean, I think right. I, I wrote this recently. You play Federer, I think the sense when I've talked to players and seen it, <clears throat> you become sort of a witness to genius. It's like, wow, you're they're playing this guy and say, and he hits his such a wide array, and it becomes, wow, I'll be able to tell my grandchildren I was beaten. And no one comes off the court having the feeling their butt was kicked by Federer. They've just been kind of all these great shots. Nadal, you compete, you know, you've competed and you've been in the arena. And Novak, it's kind of clinical in a good way. You're just, you're right. He's, he's nothing to, he's not defensive. He can be defensive, but he's not defensive. I think Novak is of the three, although Nadal's really good at this too, but Novak with, with ease and with, with a sleight of hand almost is the one that can turn defense to offense without you even realizing what's happened. So in other words, he's pushed deep in the court. He's off the court he's gumby stretched and the ball that comes back is deep the depth and and therefore neutralized and then within the next stroke he is actually dictating and on the offense and that happens repeatedly so i do think he's defensive but perhaps the one that um most artfully changes defense to offense without you even realizing it I love the sleight of hand aspect. That's right. So since you don't realize it, it's hard to see. And that's, and, that, and that's true for those of us who watch the game closely. So if people are coming to tennis to events like Wimbledon or Roland Garros or the US Open who don't follow tennis frequently, and then they see it say, well, what's, what's going on here? 
what's really occurring. And we're seeing the micro shifts. Nadal, the transition is a little more obvious and visceral because between his court positioning and his strokes, and he's, he's been thrust, thrown into one corner, and then he suddenly it, turns the tables on the point. And it happens in less shots. Like right. for Nadal, it, it could be a one shot. He's in a defensive position. He's got so much strength from these positions that it's offense, it's one shot. Novak, as you alluded to, Amy, it might be two or three. Um, and, you know, uh, let's not forget the art of not missing and not making mistakes. I mean, it's just, it's not as sexy, but it decides probably 90%, 95% of tennis matches played in the world on across all levels, probably decided by who messes up less. Uh, then you have the pros and it's a different thing. And some matches are still decided by that. Um, yeah, right. I mean, tennis really is, if you look at the numbers at any level, tennis is a sport that really has to do with errors. Totally. Um, but you know what? A lot of sports are that way. And that's why at their core, like like baseball, um, that's why the expression defense wins championships. But um, but we don't know if that's true. It's just something that people right. like to say. We're searching, like I've said before, though, we're searching for a language that transcends such rigidity as defense and offense, which in the team sports is a little more obvious because the parts of the court, whether it's soccer or basketball, now we're on defense, now we're on offense. Tennis is something else because you're both control, seeking to control this rectangle and it's, um, it's not as much defense, offense, the application of pressure. That's, and the application of pressure where there's consistency, depth, that's really what the game is about in tennis that then elicits errors. Okay, this was a good aside, but I'm going to get the train back on the tracks. Uh, Federer, <laughs> um, yeah. Federer did an interview and he reiterated his intention to play Basel and Laver Cup. Amy, there was an interesting comment that, that you mentioned to us that he, uh, he feels that th those tournaments are also well-timed with the off-season. It's right before the off-season. Uh, why, why is that convenient for Roger? Well, he, he didn't say it was convenient. The quote was something like, um, and then it's the end of the season anyway. So it, it was almost like if this point in my rehabilitation were in December or January, when I was gearing up for the year, then the implication was that he would just go ahead and play the entire year. So, but the, the key takeaway here, Gil, is that Roger Federer is not retiring. And I'll never forget True. when, when um, Wimbledon last year, and he said, look, I, I got to shut it down. I got to have surgery. And he said, but I'm not retiring. I'm not going to close the door just yet. And everyone came out and said, Roger's done. He's done. He's done. He's done. And I said, no, I came on this podcast and I said, Roger Federer is not retiring. That's not what he said. Just listen to him. Well, tennis.com took that clip and, and they ran with it as a, as a, as a tease for our podcast, then Mitch Michaels had me on and I repeated it. And it was like, Amy Lundy says, Roger Federer is not retiring. No, Roger Federer said Roger Federer wasn't retiring. And he's repeated that because he's talking about gearing up for 2023. Well, and Federer, he would, he would manage his message, you know, timing so it makes all these goods good. And Federer is always is impeccable with his timing about how he manages his announcements and his communications and, and his training and his this and the whole thing. I mean, um, I, I didn't think he was retiring. I'm part Me of the- Me either. Episode. I didn't Me think either. that's the next three of us. It's good, I'm glad, that's, that's, I love how your, what you said then got replayed. And I think the whole, again, this gets the whole thing that I, um, let's cover sport. I don't like seeing sports always covered like politics. And you came out, Amy, with the, the proper thing. This is what he said. Here's what right. he said, here's what he means onward and the whole the whole conjecture thing the whole vulture like thing retiring contending I, it's like okay so roger Federer, he's in he's rehabilitating himself he's seeking to practice he's intending another intender he's probably going to be careful and uh okay and so then in that sense he's not given us that much to talk about because again we cover performance we cover athletes doing things not just saying things and so in a way it's 
what I'm uh, what I'm sad about not being able to see Federer at Wimbledon for the first time in 20 plus years is how much fun it is to watch him play. I talked about what it's like to see the, the clay guy go to grass. Well, how about the grass guy on grass? That's really fun too. And even last year in uh, what, five, uh, five matches got to the quarters. Yeah, uh, he, he got, he was in the quarters and tough I mean, one he, early with Manorino. That was a tough one. And still, might, fun. right. Might've gotten a little lucky with Manorino getting injured in that one. I went through this with Jimmy Connors when he was in his late thir- mid late thirties, watching the genius go through the late career problem solving has its own kind of appeal. Mm-hmm. You know, the Manorino that would have been a straight setter for him 12 years ago is now a little bit of a, of a um, upper division calculus class. Although Manorino can give anyone fits, um, even Nadal. But um, what's interesting is that we've talked about this before, Joel, that the desire to retire Roger Federer, and it's not just him, it's, it's all the greats, is so strong by a certain segment of the population that the topic of Roger Federer's retirement has been a topic of discussion in the media, among fans, among people for probably 10 years now. Right. So um, my question is why? Just why? I'll tell you why. As the old, as the elder of this show. Okay. I think when people, when people want people to retire because they don't wish to see them in the decline because that forces us to face our own mortality. If Superman is, is, is losing in the quarters or the second round, what's that say about me? I, pres- I wish to preserve my memory of him looking great. A, a, a common one brought up by the American media, the great baseball player, Willie Mays, was the greatest baseball player in the 50s and 60s. And then in the 70s, he was in a World Series and he, he, he misplayed a, a fly ball. And it's like, oh my, how could we see that? What, you know, it's just like witnessing the, the decline. Now, granted, this will happen to us all. And that's one of the things that this will happen to us all. It's, it's, but I think, and there was a long, when there was as money in sports and there were other careers that athletes wanted to go on, this, I'm going back to the 60s and 70s, there was this notion, go out on top, go out on top. Pete Sampras, that ended up happening, but mostly that doesn't. And that's okay too. But Billie Jean King in 1975 announced, this will be my last Wimbledon singles. Or, or maybe she said it after she won. She won. And then she regretted that. A year later, she was still beating Everett Navratilova in practice on grass. She probably could have won Wimbledon singles, but she would go out on top and she was only playing doubles. And there, was, there are a number of athletes. And also, I think even if you look demographically, this is a little granular, there was a whole other youth emphasis. Baby boomers, don't trust anyone over 30, all this kind of stuff was going on about going out on top in a glorious way, like the Beatles or whatever. And now, now I think what happened as baby boomers aged, as people began to accept, hey, wait a second, that's, that's, that's okay. I mean, that's fine. I mean, it was a big deal when Ronald Reagan was 70 and got elected president. Now we have a president who got, he was what, 78 when he was elected. It's just a different view towards aging, but people, I don't wanna see Roger struggle. Okay, so that makes total sense. And I'm so glad that we had this conversation to refresh my memory. I guess I am truly an eternal optimist because when I see Roger Federer even beat, you know, a player like uh, Ilya Ivashka or something like that, I think, oh my God, look at what he's capable of at his age. If he can do it, that gives me hope for myself. So it's maybe it's just a different worldview. Right. But I think but I think the retiring, it's like I remember when someone, uh, a player who'd been very good was not playing well as he sunk down the ranks and someone said to me, oh, I was watching him play and he was losing. I said, he goes, it was embarrassing. I go, did you feel embarrassed? Did you mm-hmm. feel embarrassed? Why were you embarrassed? I mean, let him in, let him do it. And particularly, this isn't a team sport. In a team sport, I kind of get it because at a certain point, you're not contributing to us. You're dragging our performance down because you can't do X, Y, and Z. We can't even let you play a few minutes in the game. But this is an individual sport. He's not taken away from anyone. So, and, and so um, why not? But yeah, that retirement impulse is very, very interesting. Gil, what's your take as the youngest? My, my take is to, is to bring this, uh, you know, this, 
the I love the 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 philosophical angles here. They're great. I'm going to go a different direction, not to not to refute them at all. But the reason I thought the her the reaction to the Hercotch match, which was so visceral, was silly and and off base, is because Roger still hasn't started losing in a in a way that is going to discourage him. Uh, that never happened. That has not happened yet. Uh, you look at him making the Wimbledon quarterfinal, which it turns out was on a bum knee. Uh, the major before he played three rounds in Paris, won all three matches and decided <laughs> to withdraw, which we had our debates about. Uh, before then, he made the semifinals in Australia and nearly took a set off of Djokovic, again, completely injured uh, throughout that event and made the semis. Uh, these are his last three majors. Uh, okay, uh, U.S. Open quarterfinal 2019. Was that when he lost to Dimitrov? That was kind of a surprising loss. He's in the quarters. One major before that, match point, Wimbledon final. Like, when did Roger start losing to the extent that he's going to be like, you know what, uh, I think it's my time. I, I don't think I can compete to the level that I want to. When did that happen? It never happened. It hasn't happened yet. Yes, I love that, Gil. So it's like he may not even know what his upper limits are, or what he's capable of until he tests it. And it hasn't been appropriately tested yet. I love that take. It's usually more physical than results. The physical will, the term will trigger the results and then you'll mm -hmm. see. Yeah. All right. This was, uh, this was fun. We, we hit all three, a lot to talk about, and uh, we'll uh, get back together for the Wimbledon Draw Show next week. That'll do it for this episode of Three. Remember, we're available on all podcast platforms. We appreciate it if you leave a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, and subscribe. We'll see you next time on the next episode of Three.